Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's leadership lecture and the final one in our series for the fall semester. I'm very excited to be joined today by Dr. Helen Yu from the University of Hawaii, who's a good friend and also a colleague from the Section for Women in Public Administration for the American Society for Public Administration. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon or this evening. It's afternoon for you, but. <laughs> thank you. So Dr. Yu, um, as I shared your bio, and I'm also going to post it in the link, um, if you wouldn't mind just telling us a little, just a brief introduction and a little bit about your, um, about yourself. Okay, well, I do want to, um, uh, to thank you for the invitation. Um, it was actually, it's actually my pleasure to speak with your students. And um, I'm actually delighted to see a couple of, of my own students from the University of Hawaii, even though some of the things that I will be speaking on, they have probably heard me say over and over in my own classroom. So, so bear with me um, for, for my current students. Um, but anyway, I'm currently uh, an associate professor of public administration at the University of Hawaii at, um, at Manoa. And um, I'm also the graduate chair of, of our master's in public administration program. Um, however, most of what I'm going to really talk about is really what I did in the public sector. So if, if, if you have read my bio, um, you'll know that um, I'm actually a, re a retired uh, military officer. So I did serve just a tad over 20 years. Um, but within those 20 years, um, I served um, as a within a special duty assignment. So I was actually a special agent or a federal agent. Um, so as such, I didn't even wear a, a military uniform during that time. And if you're familiar with the TV show NCIS, which I'm sure most people are, um, um, you know, I was with an organization called AFOSI, and basically AFOSI is just the Air Force version of NCIS, very similar mission. I mean, the TV show is obviously a complete stretch, um, but it still gives you an idea of the organization that I'm with. So I was with um, OSI for 16 of my 20 years. Um, but during my at least public service career, you know, I ran the whole gamut, frontline supervisor, mid-level manager, senior manager, executive level manager. Um, so that's really the extent that I'm going to talk about. It's really my past experience, even though I'll, I will answer a couple of questions as far as um, how my background has benefited my transition into academia. So what, um, I know one of the questions that um, one of our speakers is, what made you make the transition from um, being a practitioner to an academic? Okay, so, um, so to answer that question, it's, it's not as simple as you think, because I will say that I think I started my, I, well, you know what, let me back up a little bit. I, I decided to get my PhD because an opportunity presented itself. That, that's just the best way to explain. An opportunity presented itself where I knew that I would not have to travel for about three years. Um, you know, because in my prior career, I had to travel a significant amount. But I was in a position, you know, with my organization where they said that, you know what, we're not going to move you for, for three years. And honestly, only because of that reason, I decided, well, if I'm not going to travel, I might as well better myself, okay? But let me first say that I never thought I would ever be a professor. In other words, I did not get my PhD to, to become a college professor. I wanted to get my PhD, honestly, to, I'm going to be totally honest with you, to put those three initials on my resume because I was convinced that one day I was gonna be the Secretary of Defense. And by the way, I'm not ruling that out, um, but, um, but I honestly thought I was gonna be the Secretary of Defense one day and I just wanted to have that advanced education to put it on my resume and, and so forth. And honestly, because I, again, the opportunity presented itself where there I would actually have a good 36 months to maybe pursue this higher education, um, you know, I took advantage of it. Okay. So now let's fast forward. I would say that the last five years of my 20 years as a, um, uh, you know, as a, as a public servant um, were, were challenging. I'll just leave it at that. And, um, and it no longer became fun, to be honest with you. And I just, 
wasn't really enjoying what I was doing anymore. Um, and to be honest with you, and I even wrote this in my nose, um, I actually just started to feel less valued um, as far as my contributions. And because of that, and because I knew that I had opportunities outside of, you know, being a federal agent, um, I went ahead and explored it um, exactly during my 19th year. And I, there was a position at Texas A&M University Corpus Christi, which is where I first taught. I thought I was a perfect fit for them. And I decided, you know what, what the, what the heck, let me, let me test the waters and, um, and let me see how far I can get in the, you know, application process. Okay, fast forward, uh, many steps um, and so forth. And I got the job and I turned in my retirement paperwork probably the very next day after the dean called me and says, "Oh, you got the, you got the job," but 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 like I said, it's not really, it's it's not honestly really that simple. I mean, but like I said, during the five years, I mean, you start to have to kind of like reassess. But I will say that I think because I just started to feel feel less valued, um, that was probably the big one. Um, I think a lot of women will probably resonate with this. Uh, Work life balance was non-existent, so that also, you know, played a role um, in a lot of things. Um, and then around this time, I also just then started to get really excited about really the ability to do some research and then actually make a difference in the field based on what, what I experienced. Okay, so that's what kind of led to it. So, I, so getting the PhD was not, I mean, becoming a professor was not the goal of getting the PhD. But luckily, it just kind of worked out for me towards the end. And since you mentioned your research, would you tell us a little bit about um, the type of research that you do? Okay, so, um, so I mean, in a nutshell, I mean, you know, I guess my main primary research question is really why are women underrepresented in law enforcement? I mean, that's just basically it. You know, why are, you know, why are women underrepresented in law enforcement? And that is all spurred from my experience as being a federal agent, you know, for 16 years. I mean, everywhere I went, and, and by the way, the 20 years that I was in, I relocated nine times, okay? So I've worked for nine offices um, and that is not including deployments. Okay, because I also had bosses, you know, during when I actually went overseas for, for actual uh, contingencies and deployments. Okay, but outside of that, I moved nine times. Um, and the one thing that I noticed was that I was um, often the only female, number one. Um, and, if, and then if I was lucky, if there was more than one female, then there, was, then there would be two. Okay. Um, it wasn't until I got into probably when I started to work at headquarters and then I'm like, oh my God, there's five of us, you know, but, but I would just say that there just aren't enough of, of us. So, so I based my research really honestly right now to try to try to fix that. Um, so that's my primary research question, but I look at things because I'm an HR scholar. I look at things as far as what can we do better as far as recruitment? What can we do better as far as hiring? What can we do better as far as promoting women? What can we do better um, as far as retention. So normally it still stems around how can we increase women's presence. And, and just to let you know, I mean, I'm not one of these people that thinks, okay, you know what, the, the population is 51% women or women make up 47% of the workforce. So therefore, for those of you who study, you know, representative bureaucracy, I'm not one to necessarily think, oh, you know what, I'm not going to be happy unless women make up 47% law enforcement. Okay. I'm not, I'm not that unrealistic, okay? Um, right now, uh, I mean, if you look at the percentages, federal is 13.7%. Um, state, law, state law enforcement, I think is 12.4%. Um, excuse me, local law enforcement is 12.4%. The sheriff's offices, I believe it's like 13.2%. Federal is 13.7%. And state law enforcement is 6.5%. So, so if you look at it either way, it's still under 15%. So we're not going to miraculously all of a sudden think that we're going to hit 47% one day. My goal uh, before I pass away, not anytime soon, obviously, but 
my goal is for women to at least reach 25%. If we can reach 25% or higher, I think a lot of the difficulties that women experience, a lot of it will go away. But that is what I'm hoping will, will actually happen during, during, my, during my lifetime. But, but, but in a nutshell, that is what I study. I mean, I study other things too, but that's my primary field of study. No, that's really interesting. I didn't realize it was, I mean, I figured it was low, but um, based on those numbers, um, and it kind of brings up some conversations that we had about um, when there are more women in law enforcement, how that translates into community policing mm -hmm. and, you know, relations um, and fewer incidents of, you know, misconduct reporting. Um, wanted to um, ask you, so as far as for working up, you know, you mentioned working up the ranks as women. Um, I'd be interested in that kind of if your research has looked at whether or not even within that small percentage, mm -hmm. um, how women move up in the ranks to, to move into leadership roles. Because I, I assume as, as only one, you know, um, yep. it gets even more narrow at the top. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, the irony is, is that I have a whole article about that um, that was actually published in ROPA. I actually did an article about the, uh, about the glass ceiling. Um, you know, for women in federal law enforcement, but I'll go ahead and paraphrase it because I do know that that was um, that was one of the questions that one of your students has submitted. Um, I will say that for women in a non-traditional occupation, which law enforcement is a non-traditional occupation, um, I would say that um, you know women are treated, at least on the federal side. Um, you know, it's a little bit different on the local and state side, but on the federal side. Women are, are treated pretty, pretty fairly, you know, there's a lot of equality, at least on the federal side. And I don't really recall any egregious incident that ever happened to me, probably in the first half of my career. Okay. Uh, but this is something that I think, and I'm sure you guys espouse this over at FIU, you know, in some of your classes, but, you know, but when, but when you start to move up through the ranks, um, it's no longer this quantitative formula that tells you who's going to make it to the top, okay? There's a lot of subjectivity that gets, you know, that gets involved as far as who then makes, you know, the, who, are, who are going to be the, our mid-level managers, who are going to be our senior level managers, who are going to be our executive level managers. Um, and, and there's a lot of subject, you know, subjectivity to it, okay? Um, but I would say, so in the study, you know, that I did, there were some things that really stood out. Um, and, the, and the women that I actually used in my sample were women who made it, okay? Because who, because who better than to ask them, right? Of, well, how did you, you know, achieve a past a certain rank? You know, like in other words, how did you shatter this proverbial, you know, glass ceiling? And it was interesting what they had to say and then in comparison to then another group of women who felt like they couldn't get past a certain level. And I will say that first and for, first and for, foremost, and I was actually kind of surprised at this, um, was um, perseverance, self-perseverance, okay? Like at the end of the day, if you yourself um, don't think that, you know, you can do it or maybe go through the crap that you're going to go through, because trust me, you're going to go through a lot of crap. Um, but that was the first thing, you know, and, and all the women that spoken, these are GS-15 SCSs. Some of them, one of them, by the way, is actually now running one of the major agencies, and she's actually on TV quite a bit. Uh, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dime her out, you know, because she's not the only woman. But uh, um, she actually is in Florida, not not a thing. But anyway, but never mind. Um, but every single one of them had made the comment about it's about perseverance. I mean, you have to have it within yourself to want to, um, you know, to, to kind of go up there. I mean, so that's the first. I mean, in other words, you have to count on yourself first. So that's one. Um, but the second, and this is where um, women, and a lot of research has shown this, and that is mentorship. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of mentorship. Now, here's the thing. Thank you. For, oh, now, now, here's the thing. For, for men, um, it's very easy to get mentorship for men because they're just, they're just more men, right? There's more men. Um, you know, in order to, to, to kind of find a mentor. Um, but with women, you know, because a lot of women also would like to have female mentors. Um, and that totally makes sense. And there's a, there's a lot of research that supports that. But if there aren't that many women already in these senior level positions, then it's kind of hard to find a female mentor. Um, but having said that, um, I would say that if you can't find a female mentor, 
then don't give up. I mean, you know, a mentor is still a mentor. But because when you are going through the ranks, I mean, like I said, it no longer becomes, there is no quantitative formula. It's um, who's going to advocate for you, right? Who's going to kind of bring you into the informal networks that are essential, you know, to get you through, um, you know, to get you through those, those levels. So if you, so by having a mentor that can, like I said, advocate for you, that is probably um, the biggest thing. Now, here's something that um, someone actually asked this question I was going to mention, but I'll go ahead and mention it now. If, if I could do one thing differently when I was very early on in my career, um, and honestly, it might, I might have a different outcome today. And to be honest with you, I might not even be a professor, you know, had I done this. So I'm not going to say that I, I regret it, but I'm just saying that, um, you know, I'm just one of these people, a part of it's my cultural upbringing where, you know, sometimes you don't, you don't speak up that much, right? Um, and anyone who knows me now is no, like, really, that doesn't describe you at all, because now I'm kind of in your face. But early in my career, you know, I was still a little shy, a little timid, um, and I didn't speak up that much. And even though I knew all about this, you know, informal mentoring, formal mentoring, or whatever, I actually always thought, oh, well, someone is supposed to approach me. You know, some, some mentor is supposed to approach me and it's, it's going to then say to me, I would like to be your mentor. And, um, and, and I thought that's how that worked. Um, so needless to say, that never happened. Okay. And that probably now explains why towards the end of my career, I, and even though I still retired at a very high rank, you know, so I mean, um, everything that I was supposed to achieve at my rank, I did achieve. So it's not like I didn't achieve anything that I didn't set out to. I achieved everything I wanted to set out to. Um, I mean, quite frankly, if I had stayed in, um, I know there was still a good chance I, you know, might, you know, that I would have gotten promoted again. So I didn't get cheated out of anything. Um, but, um, but I can honestly say that I did not have a mentor while I was an active federal agent. Okay, which is unfortunate, by the way. And it used to be that I used to kind of used to blame them a little bit. Do you know what I mean? Like I would blame them of going like, well how come you don't recognize how awesome I am, you know, and, and so forth. But the truth of the matter is, is that really, it's also my fault as well. Um, and, and, and I do blame some of it, you know, like I said, on my cultural upbringing and so forth. But the thing is, is that, um, and I tell this to everyone now, and I even tell this to my students, okay, you have to be proactive. I think this is where that perseverance comes in. You have to be proactive. Um, you, don't be afraid to go up to someone and just say, um, you know what, I'm such and such. Now make sure you have your resume or your CV ready so you can then showcase how awesome you are. But just say, hey, you know what, I'm such and such. I have admired your work or you've been a role model for me, blah, blah, blah. Um, I have aspirations to, to do this, you know, with company X or organization X. Um, and I would, I'm looking for an informal, you know, or formal, whatever word you want to use, mentor to guide me. Um, you know, would you be willing to, to serve as my mentor, okay? That's what I should have done early in my career. Instead of waiting for the mentors to, to come to me. I mean, cause, cause trust me, people are busy. I mean, now I know because I've had people now, I've had quite a few people now come to me and approach me about being the mentor. So now I get it, right? I mean, now I get it as far as um, where you're just so busy that you just kind of don't, don't think about it. And to be honest with you, I think I've only reached out maybe once in my entire career. So that even goes to tell you how wrong I was. So that mentorship, having someone to advocate for you will make a big difference in the world. Because again, when it comes to senior level and executive level uh, leaders that are chosen in your organization, okay, again, there's no quanti quantifiable formula is a group of people that talk about you and other groups of folks. And, and trust me, if you don't have a mentor or someone to advocate for you, um, your name gets, gets forgotten. And it's not because you're less qualified and it's not because that other person was better than you, you know, but, but, but like I said, you're not in the room, okay? It's the people that are above you that are, that are speaking for you, okay? So we talked about perseverance. Um, mentorship, that was a huge one, um, and, um, and networking, okay, those are the three I'm going to talk about going up through the, by the ranks, and here's the thing about networking, and I also have taught this in my classroom, but the thing is, is that 
networking starts when you leave your house, okay? Networking does not start when you attend a conference room. I mean, excuse me, when you attend a, a conference, okay? You don't have to go to a networking event to network, okay? Um, networking starts the moment you leave your house. Now, okay, I realize that we're on COVID right now. We're not leaving the house. So, so networking begins when you enter a Zoom uh, session, okay? Because the bottom line is, is that you never know what the person that you may come across, right? I mean, you know, um, the moment you leave your house. I've actually networked with someone that I met at the grocery store. And ironically, I actually had my CV on me because I was coming from, um, from work one time. And, um, and, and, and I'm one of these uh, individuals, I, mean, I don't carry a purse, I carry a briefcase. And I just had, I just, so, so I always keep a copy of, of my CV. Uh, this obviously a while ago, because obviously before we were just, now we would just email it. And I just actually struck up a conversation with, while we were waiting to cash out. And it just turned out that we just had some similar interests and I just handed them my, my CV, okay? Um, or someone has saw me or, or whatever, okay? But the bottom line is, is that networking begins the moment you leave your house and, and quite frankly, how, how you conduct yourself will get noticed, okay? And this is why sometimes I tell, tell this to my students as far as because sometimes I'm kind of amazed at how the students act in the classroom of going like, you know what, you don't know your classmate that's sitting two seats down from you could be the, could be the next city manager at city, county, X, Y, Z, you know, or this next person, you know, will have a very prominent position and they're going to remember some great things that you might have said in the classroom. And, and they may also remember some not so great things, you know, whatever. And I say this because I had a, a, a class where um, the HR director of this city was actually one of my students. And I was, I couldn't believe some of the behavior that some of her classmates um, were displaying. Cause I remember thinking going like, do you not realize that such and such is the HR director of this particular city. And that if you ever apply for a job at this particular city, it's probably gonna go by her desk and she's probably gonna remember. I mean, you know, it's, so it's things like that. But I would say that networking also um, would be a big thing. So from going through your ranks, um, per perseverance, mentorship, can cannot discount that as much. Um, and then, um, and then networking, I would say, are probably probably the top three. And then that is, of course, assuming that you're also just great at what you do for, um, you know, whatever position that you're applying for. Like I, that, it's a givey that you're great at what you do. It's all the other three things that's going to kind of separate you from from the masses. I would like to really second a couple of things that you said. Um, I'm privileged, I think, to consider you a mentor, um, someone who's really kind of helped me and in, in grow. Um, and I'm so thankful to have met you through SWAPA, through the section for women in public administration. Um, but you talk about networking. I still recall several years ago, and I, I actually told Dr. Yu this, I remember meeting her at a conference when I was a doctoral student. And I was walking around the conference scared, didn't know who to talk to. and just a little bit of kindness, a hello, asked me where I was from, it went a long way to making me feel comfortable there. Um, and you never, like Dr. You said, you just, you never know who you're going to meet and where you'll build a connection um, that may end up, you know, being a colleague in the future or um, a co-worker, a subordinate. So um, definitely putting yourself out there and you just, you never know the connections that you will, that you will form. Um, and putting yourself out there, having a thick skin and not taking it personally if things don't work out. Um, I personally have emailed a lot of people asking for mentors, people asking me and it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. Some work out, some don't. Right. Um, but again, unless you put yourself out there, you'll never really know. Yeah. Um, so, so I appreciate what Dr. C just said and I do wanna just kind of echo something. Networking is not easy. I mean, so, I mean, the way I might've just been speaking, you know, might make it seem like, oh, this is second nature to me. You have no idea how hard um, it is for me. Like for me, networking with law enforcement personnel is very easy, okay? Because remember, I mean, th that's my entire career. 
So when I'm around other federal agents, I mean, it's like, it's like hanging out with your cousins in the summertime, okay? So I don't have a problem networking with law enforcement folks because we already speak our own unique language. But, it, I, but even though I've now been a professor going on my um, seventh year, Networking at conferences, academic conferences are very, I mean, I still get nervous, okay? Now, I'm sure some people have probably heard that term, you know, the imposter syndrome. Now, I don't have that, okay? I don't have that. But it's just that um, it's still new to me. I mean, when you spend 20 years in one career and then you kind of transition over, um, I believe this incident that Dr. C is talking about, I mean, that happened really early in my career. I mean, I'm now no longer nervous at conferences, but I'm talking about like really early on. It was really, um, it's not as easy as you think, but I just want to echo, you know, what, what Dr. C says in regards to the fact that um, sometimes, you, you know, like you said, you got to put yourself out there. And, it's, and I think you told me that I did this in an elevator of all places, you know? Um, and you know what? I don't know if in the classroom, have you guys gotten to that? Um, you know, when you, actually, you know what? I just said this in my class last night about the lecture when, when we're talking about social identity theory, where in social identity theory, you have a tendency to uh, kind of congregate around towards people that are familiar to you. So like for me, when I'm in an uncomfortable position, I'm naturally gonna navigate towards other women or other Asian women or other um, women of color, you know? So, um, so that's another way, you know, you can get out of your comfort zone. But yes, I still can't advocate enough about networking, um, but I also recognize that it's not as easy as, as, as one might think, because it's not, it's not, you know, but, but you do have to put yourself out there. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you'll be. It's kind of yes. like public speaking. <laughs> yes, yes, that is true. And then after a while, you realize everybody's nervous and everybody, yes. you know, has a bit of anxiety to a certain degree. So you're really, you're not alone. <laughs> yes. I actually want to go, um, I see that Franz had posted a question in the chat, which I'm going to go back to, if you don't mind. Um, because is there data to suggest that the presence of women in these non-traditional fields helps to create increased representation over time? Um... I mean, yes, there is research that's out there. Um, and I would say that for local law enforcement, so for local law enforcement, I'm talking about local police departments and sheriff's departments, um, and, and as well as state. I will say that even those, num even those, those numbers that I just presented you, you know, I think I said 13.2 uh, uh, for local, I mean, excuse me, 12.4 for local, 13.2 for sheriff's and 6.5 for state. Even though those numbers sound low, they were significantly lower 20, 30 years ago. I mean, they were all single digit. So, so yes, by having women in, that has increased the numbers, you know, and I am kind of happy to say that at least on the local side. So when you talk about local police departments, so like where you, you guys are at, you guys have both the Miami-Dade police department, but then you also have Miami police department, which are two of the top 50 uh, local law enforcement agencies in the country. I know that because I'm actually writing an article on that right now. But anyway, um, I digress. Um, but so, yes, by having women more, what it does, it, it helps the next generation of young girls, right, that when they see um, other women in this job, then they actually think, oh, you know what, well, well maybe this is a viable option. Because there actually, there's actually a theory out there. I forget the name of the theory, but they did actually say that that's actually one of the reasons why there aren't that many women, because normally people, young children pick careers because they know someone, you know, who, who is actually in that career. So because um, more young little boys might know, have someone in their family, right, you know, like the, either their dad or their uncle or someone, right, in the community that's a police officer, they might, they now might be interested in being, being a police officer. But whereas little girls don't necessarily have that, right, they may know someone who's like a teacher or a nurse and and that's one of the reasons reasons why but anyway but to answer your question yes there is data that says that there is a steady steady increase um so it has made a difference but we're not even close to even being there okay not even close because federal has actually taken a step back twice we're actually going backwards now. I mean, the highest that we were at was 16.1%. And in 
and that was in 2004. And then when the census came out in 2008, we dropped to 15.5. And then we thought, oh, okay, that's not too bad. But then in the most recent census that came out in 2016, we're down to 13.7. So, um, so we're actually going backwards, but there's another reason for it now. But I mean, but the bottom line is, is that yes, even though we're starting to see more women in, you know, until we hit 25%, it's not going to be enough. You know, but um, but but I do think that um, some of the TV shows are helping. You know, like for example, with the federal side. Um, the women are depicted very well. Actually, all the women, you know, police detectives, police officers, federal agents are depicted well on TV. But I mean, it's kind of sad that Hollywood does more for us than some of the actual agencies themselves. Um, but, um, but this is basically my long answer to a very simple question, which is, it's a steady increase, but, um, you know, but, but I'm still a firm believer, like, like I was talking about representative bureaucracy, we talk about passive and active. You know, I still believe that um, the more women we have, um, the better chance that um, women, women that are currently in, they will now consider to stay longer. Um, and I had a career, like I retired, retired, um, you know, so I didn't just do it a little bit and, and then get out. And then as we're bringing in younger folks, um, you know, they're, you know, they will now be interested in that type of occupation. And I will say that the best compliment that I have ever received in my entire life, and I've heard it a couple of times, but it never gets old, which is uh, the reason why I wanted to be X, you know, uh, was because of you, you know, so the reason why I wanted to pursue law enforcement was because, you know, you, because of you were law enforcement and, you know, et cetera. So that is honestly, um, I, I love hearing that, to be honest with you, so. One thing I hear because um, our department also has kind of a sister department with criminology and criminal justice. Do you feel that um, students who want to go into law enforcement, do they have to have a degree in criminology or criminal justice or some background? Um, um, you know what? Absolutely not. Um, but but having said that, it also depends which which intergovernmental level of law enforcement that you work in, okay? So in other words, if you work in local or state law enforcement, okay, um, where, you know, you want to work in a police department, um, sheriff's office, you know, highway patrol, you know, state investigations, whatever, um, criminal, um, a criminal justice degree uh, is, um, is a good, it's a good degree to have, okay? That's, it's, it's, it's actually one of the reasons why criminal justice is, is actually one of the most popular degrees offered in the United States, all right? Um, so if you want to go into local and state, there's nothing wrong with the CJ degree. CJ degree is, is amazing. But I do have to break, but I've also had to break the news that, but if you want to work in federal law enforcement, okay, because we are not first responders. I mean, so, in some investigations like terrorism and things like that, we are the first responders. But federal law enforcement is is mostly all investigation, okay? And a lot of these organizations, I mean, yes, you can have a degree in CJ, but a lot of organizations don't look for that. They actually look for any of the financial types of degrees, like accounting, um, anything that involves critical thinking. Um, if you, um, the FBI have, I don't know if people know this, but half of all FBI agents have a law degree, Ooh, you know, nice. so, um, so if you want to work for the FBI, uh, you might want to get your law degree first, um, you, know, and, you know, and so forth. But I would say that CJ degrees are not as popular on the federal side because they're looking for things, um, you know, to really, you know, sharpen your, your critical thinking. An engineering degree, accounting degree, financial management. Um, uh, uh, I mean, like I said, anything that, like I said, works, works, works with number. Um, but I would also say overall for all law enforcement, if you speak a foreign language, that's a bonus too, okay? Because especially if you work on the local side and because of community you know, policing and you're really out there interacting with the community, um, it, is, I mean, it, can, it can benefit you um, throughout your career. You know, like I said, if you have to interact with the community that speaks with another language, that can also really, really set you apart. I actually do speak a couple of other languages, you know, outside of English. However, um, one has never helped me and one actually did greatly help me. Um, but I'd rather not disclose what those languages are, so. <laughs> oh, 
Uh, that is, um, talking about career advice and um, one of the questions that came in was, uh, what is the best piece of advice you received in your career that you would pass along? Okay. All right. So I'm going to give you the one that someone told me pretty early on. Um, and I've lived my entire career to include right now as a professor. And then I'm going to give you two of mine, even though I know I'm not the first person who has said it. Okay. So I would say that the one thing that someone told me very early on, and I mean, when I say early on, I mean like my first year at, straight out of undergrad. Okay. So I'm, I don't want to really date myself, but let's just say it's almost been 30 years. Okay. But shortly after undergrad, um, someone has said that, you know what, whenever you are given a task, Okay, if you are given any kind of job to do, no matter how small or no matter how big, you need to tackle that assignment like you're like you're trying to cure cancer. And what we mean by that is there is no job that is too small. There is no job that is too big, because at the end of the day, the way you're going to get measured is how well you did that job. And um, because guess what? You may not realize it, but people are going to notice, right? No one is going to be thinking, oh my gosh, she did an amazing job, but that, but, but that task wasn't hard. No, that second part never gets said out loud. All they're going to remember is, God, this person did a really great job on this project or this task. Um, you know, and I remember someone, you know, telling me that. And I was like, you know what? Okay, I don't know what they're talking about, you know, but I'm green, I'm new or whatever. Um, but I will also say that it's also in my personality. I'm, 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 a, I'm a bit of an overachiever. So um, it's in my personality that anything that you give me, I wanna, I wanna do a good job, right? Um, so it kind of already kind of, like I said, it complemented my work ethics and my work styles. But, but the point is, is that I know for a fact that um, it, it has actually kind of, that, that there's actually some truth to it because I've had people then much later in my career, um, what? will bring up something that I did like 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And they're like, you know what? I remember um, you, your name being, you know, brought up one time because of the thing that you worked on. And I was like, really? <laughs> I mean, and so my point is, is that people notice. So, um, so don't look at something where, so if you get a task and you think it's too small, don't think of it as this, this is beneath me. Or, you know, don't they realize that I can do more than that? You know what, whatever task you were given, you know, listen to your boss, obviously, but you know what, you should tackle it with 100% effort and then some, um, because that is the, really the work reputation that you wanna have, right? And regardless of where you then progress, you wanna have that reputation of, of, of them knowing, look, whatever, whatever task you give her, um, she's going to give you hundred percent, no matter how big no, nor small. Okay. So I would say that, um, and I, and I'm glad, and, and I can speak from personal experience that people did notice, they did listen. I mean, they, they noticed, um, uh, without even me, me noticing. So that's my first, um, advice that I would give to anyone to have a successful career. Uh, and then I'm going to give you two that are my own. Um, and I also have mentioned this in my classroom. So sorry, my students that are listening, um, the first one that I will also mention is when you are given, well, actually, you know what, let me tell you the first one. Let me, let me switch the order. Um, I have this mantra um, and I've had this mantra since probably college, which is um, when I'm on my deathbed, I don't want to have any regrets. Okay. That, that's just, that's just it. I don't want to have any regrets on my, on my, on my deathbed. Hopefully not anytime soon, obviously. So, so whenever um, I have to make like a life decision or a life choice or really any major decision, both personal and professional. And by the way, whenever you make a major decision like that, it's never easy, by the way. It's something, something's gonna have to give, okay? Something's gonna have to give. Um, and, and what helps me make that decision is I always tell, ask myself on my deathbed, I'm, am I going to regret it? Am I going to regret this personal decision that I'm making over a career decision? Am I going to regret this on my deathbed? And vice versa, am I going to regret this career decision over my personal life at, at the end? Okay. 
And, and that's how I've made a lot of, actually, that's not how I made a lot. That's how I've made 100% of all major decisions, both personal and career. And it's, and it's whether or not will I regret it, okay? Will I regret giving up something by accepting whatever and vice versa, okay? So I'm not, I'm not gonna say I'm pro-personal. I'm not gonna say that I'm pro-career because it also depends on each individual person. So, um, so I shared that with you about, you know, making, since we're talking about careers, you know, make your career decisions where you have no regrets, okay? So that segues into my other point, which is um, you will be given opportunities, okay? You will be given opportunities. And your job is just to be prepared when those opportunities come up, okay? You don't know when an opportunity is gonna present itself, okay? But your job is that when an opportunity presents itself that you are ready, okay? And then most importantly, then you take advantage of that opportunity, okay? I swear to God, I just said this last night in my class. Um, this is much more difficult for women than it is for men. I swear, I just said this in my lecture last night. Of all the male, I mean, I'm, I'm at the point in my career that all of my colleagues now that are still in law enforcement, they're now all, some of them are directors of their agencies. Some of them are the number two person in their agency. Some of them are number three person. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm at the point where almost everyone I know is all at the top. I just don't know any of the younger folks anymore. But when I actually look back on all of them, every male, and, and this is the reason why they're in the position that they're in. Every male colleague of mine that has risen through the rank 100% of them have taken advantage of an opportunity, 100% of them, okay? Um, and, and, and that's why they are where they are at, okay? And I don't have anything, I don't have anything against that. I mean, good on them, quite frankly. Um, but I find that with women, um, because, I mean, let's face it, women have primary care, child care responsibilities, okay? Women are the ones that have children and women are the ones that are the ones to sacrifice uh, you know, their, their careers and, the, and their so forth for, for their family. Okay. Now I'm never going to say to anyone, male or female, not, not to do it. Okay. Um, because at the end of the day, everyone is different. Okay. And this is the reason why I want to bounce back to that. Just don't have any regrets. Like just don't have regrets. You know, when I'm 99 on my death pics, that's, that's when I, that's how long I want to live. Right. So, um, so again, there are certain, like for me, um, you know, certain opportunities presented itself and I just made sure that I just took full advantage of it, you know, and I never passed one up because I knew that again, when I'm 99, I just didn't want, um, you know, I just didn't want to have, just didn't want to have, have regrets. Okay. Because, um, you know, to get to the higher ranks, you have to fulfill certain stepping stone positions and, um, you know, and you have to, act, you have to accept them, right? Um, but again, I can't emphasize enough that you have to come, you need to, you need to kind of like better yourself, um, you know, when it's that. And, and if you remember what I said at the very beginning, I mean, there are people that I went to high school with that will actually probably tell you, I can't believe she even went to college, okay? Not because I wasn't smart, I was actually very intelligent. Um, I still consider myself to be very intelligent, but I just do not like to go to school. I mean, I just don't, I'm not a really big school person. Um, and the fact that I went to school three times, if you think about it, it's just, even I kind of kind of laugh at myself. Um, but if you recall from the very beginning, uh, I had a job that they were sending me to and they gave me a guarantee that, hey, look, we're not going to deploy you for these three years. We're not gonna send you overseas. We're not gonna send you on all these business trips that I had to do for five years prior to that. Okay, you're basically, you just had to do your job at this one location for three years. And you know what? I could have honestly have spent those three years just doing my job, doing my job well, which, which, I, which I would have done anyway, you know, spend more time with my husband, okay. He's already there, you know, I see him every day. So it's not that big of a deal. But then I just thought, you know what? I'm gonna take advantage of this opportunity. That's what I say. I'm gonna take advantage of this opportunity of not having to travel for three years for work. And you know what? And why not use that opportunity to better myself? Okay. So that's an academic example. But, but I will say that every single leader out there, 
and I don't care if you're nonprofit, private sector, or public sector, there is some luck that's involved to getting where you're going to get, okay? And a lot of that luck is being at the right place at the right time, but because when that opportunity is presented to you, you had whatever it is that you needed to have to then take advantage of that opportunity, okay? So I can't stress that enough. So those are my things. So the one I kind of mentioned as far as tackle everything, give 100%, you never know who's watching. That's my biggest advice. That will pay off dividends. I, I cannot even begin to mention. And then I shared with you my, my two. I couldn't agree with those more. Um, you know, as far as for kind of building your reputation and your brand, again, you never really know who's watching, who's paying attention. Um, and as you said, a lot of those opportunities can come along just when you are doing the best that you can. And even when you think people aren't taking notice, they are, and you know, opportunities can arise from that. Since we're coming towards the end, I wanted to um, give a few minutes to see if anybody um, had any questions, any of the students who are participating. Or comments? Um, if I may, thank you yes. so much, Dr. Oh, hi. Thank you so much, Dr. Yu. Um, I was curious, ultimately it was a wordy question, but, um, from an organizational standpoint, um, in terms of increasing representation, have you found some sort of, um, you know, maybe not one silver bullet, so to speak, but have you seen that uh, those organizations that display certain cultural uh, proclivities cert have certain women? Could you, uh, or have an increased amount of representation? Uh, yes, okay, this is actually a very, this is actually a very simple question to ask. Um, but yet, um, so many agencies don't do this, okay? But it's very, very simple. It's very appropriate to this, to this lecture series. It all starts from the top. It all starts with leadership. It's just that simple. Um, if the, so if you're talking about local law enforcement, you talk about a police chief. You know, if you talk about a sheriff's office, you're talking about the sheriff, right? If you talk about a state agency, it's going to be the state police director. If you're talking about federal law enforcement, it's going to be the director of that agency. The bottom line is whoever has that top seat if they want to diversify their organization, and by diversify, I mean both gender and race, if he or she wants to diversify it, he or she can make it happen. It's really, it's really that simple. If he or she does not want to diversify it, then guess what? They're not going to diversify it. And I will say another thing too. Um, and I would say this in front of all 3,000 plus police chiefs in all 49 state police agency directors and all 100 plus federal directors, which is um, they all like to do the talk. They all do the talk. Oh yes, I believe in diversifying. They all like to do the talk, but you know what? I can count on, okay, there's more than a dozen, but you know what? But so few will actually do the walk. It's just that simple, just plain and simple. And um, if, you're, if you're leader of that organization, like I said, once you're diverse, they, they can make it happen. And there are some agencies that, that have been very successful okay, in, in, all, in all intergovernmental level, local, state, and federal. Um, but if they don't proactively want to be engaged, then it's not going to happen. So it starts from the top. This is actually, yeah, this is actually really, really simple. And I've actually witnessed going like, wow, you, you, you sure do talk a good game. Okay, now, wh now what are you going to do about it? Because I can tell you right now that there are 100 academics out there, to include myself, as well as uh, thousands of practitioners that, that can tell you how to increase your numbers. But if you're not going to actually proactively do it, um, then, then, then no, it's, it's not going to happen. Okay, but, but, but yeah, but this is actually really, really simple. So yeah, a lot of it comes down to intention, you know, they have to be intentional about it. Yeah. yeah, it all starts from the top. So David asked in the chat, uh, which do you think is more important, education or experience? In what context? That's a trick question. In what context? 
That, that's a good point, you know, because again, it depends on the field and the amount of training and experience yeah. that may be required. Um, okay. It's always good, I think, depending on the qualifications, if the job description requires a certain amount of education yeah. you get around that. I will. Okay, so I will say this. Um, there are some occupations that is referred to as low density, okay? And what I mean by low density is there are some jobs out there, and I will say that what I did as a federal agent would, would include, so if you read my bio, you know that I'm a counterintelligence, counterterrorism expert, okay? There aren't that many, I mean, there's hundreds of us, but there still aren't that many of us. So we are what is considered a low density area of expertise, okay? You know, so there's, there's not that many of us that have this area of expertise, okay? So if I'm applying for a job um, to do that specific job, and because there aren't that many of us, I'm gonna get the job even with a high school diploma, okay? Because there aren't that many that has that experience. Do, do you see what I mean? But if you're talking about a job that there's plenty of availability for, then education can can set you apart. So it really it really depends on the field. I mean, quite frankly, where if there, if, if it's a field that yeah there there aren't that many of you, then yes, I will go with work experience. But if it's a field that there's plenty of folks, then then that advanced degree can can single single you out. But I will say this. So as you know, I'm a college professor now. My practitioner background is the whole reason why I got hired as a professor both times. And I know this because they both told me that. I mean, even though I have a PhD, so obviously I was qualified. I mean, no matter what, I still have a PhD. I mean, I was still qualified, but I will say that what singled me out amongst other people with PhDs was hands down my practitioner experience. Um, because there, again, because there aren't that many of us, you know, that are PhDs that also have practitioner experience. But there's even a term for it, pracademics. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that is correct. Wrote a paper on that too. <laughs> so, well, we really appreciate the time that you took to spend with us this evening. Uh, just if you have any final thoughts, um, I want to personally thank you just for the leadership that you've shown um, and your mentorship and guidance. As some of the issues that you bring up, um, especially as it relates to gender. Um, it's going to be interesting to see the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, especially as we're trying to make inroads and wondering how this is going to impact, um, you know, progress in, in closing those gender gaps. Right. Sure. Right. Well, if, if anything, we're, we're actually, I'm sure you've noticed this too, but we're actually noticing that women are once again taking a bigger hit during COVID, right? because you would think that working from home would kind of make things a lot easier, but, but guess what? The kids are also now home. I mean, there was a time where you had school to send them away to, you know? Um, but now kids also have to now be taking care of the households, you know? And, um, and it depends how your household dynamics are, you know? I mean, some, not to, not to dog on the men, you know, but some men really, really step up. They really do. Some fathers really, really step up. But let's get real, some fathers do not, okay? Um, and unfortunately, it's, it's the female uh, mother, career woman, you know, that kind of has to, to pick, up, pick up that slack. So we're actually starting to see that. So I actually think that unfortunately COVID has actually, women have actually taken, um, have gone a little, little, little backwards because of this. But again, it has, it's a continuation of the work-life balance problem that has really existed for quite some time and will continue to exist. Definitely, and we're all going to work together and support one another to get through this together. Um, with that being said, I want to again thank you again so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us. Um, if there are any final thoughts or comments from um, our students in attendance. Okay, well, I do want to uh, thank you for the gracious um, hospitality. Um, I was actually quite impressed with the turnout. I really thought there was going to be like four people, and that was including myself. So, uh, so I am actually very impressed with uh, uh, with, with the turnout. And, and I and again, I appreciate the invitation and your hospitality. 
Oh, it's my pleasure. And thank you all, everyone, for joining us this evening. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend, uh, a nice end to your semester. Let's all end strong. Um, and just enjoy your holiday, um, Thanksgiving, and just stay safe and take care, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us.